I remember, uh, I remember the play. You know, it's a good game. It's 20 to, I'm going to say 20 to 27. I mean, it's a seven point game. We're ahead. They're trying to drive down the field. You know, they're moving the ball down the field. He runs a route. You know, the quarterback hits him. He turns it up. A couple guys kind of missed the tackle. He, and as he turns up, he's moving up the field and he runs into both of our safeties. Belly hit very hard on the turf, and back in those days, the turf was very hard. It's the turf. The turfs nowadays are much more cushioned than they were back in those days. It was like falling on a piece of concrete, really, that had been fuzzed over. And suddenly there were all these people congregating around the player, and he was down. And then the stadium just got really, really quiet. We then, by then, we knew something was terribly wrong. Because they called all the. The paramedics, everybody came down, and there was quite a bit of silence in the audience. You know, I mean, it brought a hush to everyone because you knew Ed was hurt. You knew he he was hurt when he hit the turf. The silence, you probably could have heard a pin drop. The mood stopped, and everyone's kind of waiting. And then, okay, he gets up, and he gets up, he's a little wobbly. Normally, when, when guys are a little wobbly, you think that they got dinged a little bit. And he went down, and he got up, and kind of stumbled toward the uh, sideline, and he collapsed. He collapsed at the bench, but he did uh, come off of the field himself. But Dr. Hockey could see that he was staggering and that there was a problem. I went up to, uh, to uh, Ed, and about the same time, simultaneously, Dr. Uh, Hockey was coming out of the stands to uh, give assistance in the sideline. He told us later that normally he would sit behind the Oregon bench. He's a big Oregon fan. Why would he go around the Colorado bench? But he said, for some reason, I decided that I would go around and sit behind the bench. And so he came right on down to the field, introduced himself, and asked the uh, team people if they had the, the drug Manitol, which shrinkens the brain. And so they started to, uh, to give Ed this drug that would help shrink in the brain so as the blood would seep out it would give the, uh, the brain would be shrunk enough to where it would make room for the blood until they could get in and out. some better people, I'm going to have to let you go. Um, so I went out and I found the biggest and the best high school tight end in the United States. Back in, in 1984, we were trying to expand our recruiting throughout the western United States and began recruiting Colorado in 1981 and 1982. Ed was probably the premier tight end, not just in the western United States, but really in, in the entire United States. We were running a pro-style offense at that time here at the university, and Colorado was my particular recruiting area along with uh, Northern California. And we made a very strong effort to recruit uh, Ed. Since I had a knowledge of the family and had a relationship with the family uh, after the game that day, um, I went to the hospital, discussed with Mr. Reinhardt the fact that Mrs. Reinhardt and Ed's sister were in Lincoln uh, watching his brother John play at the University of Nebraska and obviously we needed to get them here quickly. My role after the game was uh, of course tr try to get the parents uh, over here from uh, Colorado and the problem was getting the air, air tickets uh, for them to come. First step was to check commercial flights and there were none available and then uh, the second choice was, okay, who do we know that has an airplane that can go out there, pick them up, and bring them back? And again, private planes back in those days, you know, they didn't have great range, and there weren't jets and, and that sort of thing. There were turboprops, I think, was about the best you could get at that time. So you had a football team waiting to go home in the University of Colorado, and that had to be addressed. You obviously had issues with the family to get the family here to be with Ed, uh, during the course of this very difficult time. And 
last thing, we as a, as a staff here at the University of Oregon had to move on as well. It was very traumatic for our players and our staff to see a young man that we knew and knew well from the recruiting process uh, to have been injured so seriously. And at the same time, the, the young men who were involved in the hit that injured him, the impact that it had on them. After the game, we go in and uh, Coach Brooks comes in. He goes, you know, the kid collapsed and they took him on an ambulance and there's some real issues. All of a sudden, everyone's heart just sunk. I mean, Jeff and, and Dan were really, they were big time safeties. But on this particular play, it, there was no big hit. You know, there was no big hit. And so when Coach Brooks said, you know, told him, grabbed those guys and told him that, that this situation is, 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 is pretty bad, I mean, those guys were just, I mean, they just, because all of a sudden, as a football player, you know, you've been trained, you know, to, to contact, to hit, to go, to go. And you never think about all of a sudden someone got hit and, and you're on the field and you're part of it and that person might die. We did what we could do. And, and again, people stepped up. That was, that was the amazing thing. I mean, the, people, the staff at Sacred Heart, uh, people within our department, boosters, friends of the university, friends of their family, uh, the, the, the staff at, at Nebraska, because I, as I recall, we contacted uh, the coaches at Nebraska uh, to, to let them know what had happened and what we were attempting to do and was there any way they could help you know, get the family out here. Well, we, we got the Reinhardts over here and we were fortunate enough to have the Holiday Inn open rooms for them and uh, we also got cars uh, for their transportation from uh, the uh, Cadillac uh, car dealership here in Oregon, uh, Dunham's. And we did the best we could to give them housing and transportation. Everyone, you know, in the community and the news stayed up on it. Everyone was kind of involved in it. I know that the players, a lot of players went over to the hospital to see them. I know Dan and, 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 and Jeff went over maybe the next maybe the next day after. We had so much traffic the first few days into the ICU because there were a lot of physicians that wanted to come in that didn't really have anything there but they wanted to see about him because everybody was concerned. It was a it was a huge um, event in our community. Yeah the community embraced them. I mean it was a big deal and, and, they, and the great thing about Eugene it's, it's a college town and the community the college community is important. So just knowing, you know, as the information evolved and all of a sudden, you know what, it was something more. It, was, it wasn't just a little ding on the head. There was something really wrong, okay? So now the community is more involved. And, and I think that's why even now, anytime he comes to this town, he's going to get standing ovations. But it is with great pleasure and great honor to have Ed Reinhardt Sr and Ed Reinhardt Jr. with us here today. Please give them a warm warm. I was really happy that uh, we've kind of come full circle and, uh, and to be able to come back to Eugene and also to be able to see so many uh, people we had met before and, uh, and think about the uh, the goodness, the kindness that was shown to us while we were here. It, it was different. He, he was big, still big in stature, but uh, his memory uh, was gone except what he could, uh, what he was uh, taught uh, as uh, uh, from uh, like a child on. They had quite a crew. I don't remember exactly how many, but there were, I think, hundreds of people in the community that came to their home and began working with him from ground up, teaching him how to crawl, teaching him just basics of, of uh, mobility. And they had teams of people that came in for hours of shifts each day. And he had quite a regimen in, in terms of teaching him to come back. He forgot all of the things he knew but they taught him by memory each thing, and he learned how to speak by singing a song. In his therapy, they um, said, and unable to speak, they said, why don't you send him to singing lessons? That'll help speech, and then the speech will help singing. So 
he was uh, such a celebrity, I'll put it. He was in the bed that was immediately across from the nurse's station. So everybody was looking in all the time. I mean, whether we went into the room or not, we were all observing in terms of what was happening. Well, I think first off, you had, you know, whatever there was in Autzen Stadium that day, 25,000 people, 27,000, I don't know what it was. But you had all of those folks who obviously were aware of what occurred. Obviously, the newspaper, Register Guard, had a lot of information about it. You had all the people at Sacred Heart that knew that there was a young man in there who had played football from Colorado that was fighting for his life. We're both the nurses that took care of him <laughs> in the ICU. So we're just recollecting some of the things that we remember. Yeah, we were which just... was like, he was huge. <laughs> he didn't fit our beds. Mm -hmm. But he was very, very sick. Very sick. Very sick, yeah. And his parents were there night and day. Night and day, mm -hmm. and never left his side. There were no. so many people who would come to the hospital just to uh, to pray for Ed that he would survive, and then we had all eight of us out here at that time, and uh, by then, and, and they were bringing food in, and, and, uh, and all the kindness that was given to us. From the uh, intensive care uh, nurses to the doctors, uh, Dr. Hockey, the neurosurgeon, uh, all the team physicians, and all the staff at uh, Sacred Heart Hospital, the community, the University of Oregon, all chipped in, <clears throat> and it was a, a, a wonderful outpouring of love and caring uh, for Ed Reinhardt. If, if, support, if you look to my left, you'll see a banner that he kept all these years from 1987. This is the banner the Daisy Ducks put up in Ed's hospital room. On, the, on your table, you'll see a list of the names that were on that banner. But this is what it's all about, ladies. I was there. Nice to meet you, Mary. Mary, she's one of the people on your banner. I remember the family being here. I remember Daisy Ducks helping them out and taking them meals or having them for dinner or going to the hospital and all that sort of thing while he was here. I think it's wonderful. I'm amazed. I'm surprised. It's really very good. I just think it's a marvelous example of parents' love. They've done for him. I was thrilled to see how much farther he's come in his walking, in his communicating. His sense of humor had certainly reemerged. Um, communication is still and you know is still in progress. But I think he'd made so much progress from the last time I'd seen him. It was very heartwarming to see. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we went back to the 37-yard line. It brought back many poignant memories. And some of them were very vivid, and some of them were fading. I think we needed a little bit of closure, and not that we had to have that, but it, it was a, a great way to work work with the University of Colorado and Oregon and have a kind of a bonding uh, effect there. And that after the injury and accident that we didn't forget them, that mm -hmm. there are situations where the families and everybody get together and we still care about them. Community over 28 years ago, a former tight end for the Colorado Buffaloes suffered a life-altering hit during the September 1984 football game. Against we were standing there, and I wanted to see some motion, or I wanted to see something, so I just kind of leaned over and I said, Ed, raise your hand. You know, so Ed raised his hand, and that's when the audience really exploded. A model of perseverance and inspiration to us all. Joining us at Austin for the first time since suffering his injury, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Ed Reinhardt Jr. along with his father, Ed Reinhardt Sr. Welcome back, Ed. And so I said, Ed, turn around a little bit. So he started to turn around to the folks behind him, and that part of the stadium just went erupted. I was thrilled. I was thrilled to see him. Um, brought back lots of memories. I just wanted to run down and hug him when I saw him down there. It was just like, wow. 
I just really felt good and, and relieved and kind of pe very peaceful about it all. It, it was a, a homecoming to say the least. It was a, a wonderful outpouring of love from the community and the university. It's, it's sad that the, he, he had to have an injury and that we got to know each other in that way. But uh, it's wonderful that they, they brought him back for a reunion here. Unfortunately, when he was on the field prior to the game, we were in the locker room, so I did not get a chance, and I would have loved to actually been there and, and just seen that, experienced it, because it, I was part of it. Yeah, well, especially, you know, I was in the tunnel and watched it. Uh, Ed was in the locker room before the game, so I got to spend some time with him. I see Ed uh, uh, semi-regularly. You know, every time I've been back here uh, since the incident, you know, it's something that uh, you know, at the forefront, but uh, Oregon's always been a special place in my heart because I know this community, what they did for his family and what they did to save his life uh, was above and beyond. Well, you, you gotta remember John Embry was Reinhardt's uh, roommate and classmate. And they played together, he was here at that time, so he remembers that incident very, very vividly. And for, for Ember to be the coach when we when they came back, it had to be a special uh, gathering at that time, and we we're very glad that uh, that Reinhardt and Embry could all be together at the same time at uh, Austin Stadium again. That ovation and how they applauded him uh, did not surprise me because that just because um, that's how what kind of people they are here, and that's what uh, kind of fans are. I really think that Eugene, Oregon is a special place. And I think it's evident in what happened with Mr. Reinhardt. And 20 some years ago, this, you know, we have a tragedy. And now um, he comes back to town and it's, you know, everyone knows who he is, embracing him. And it's not just a casual visit where he comes back to kind of look at the field and kind of replay what happened to him. He's a celebrity, it's a big deal. You know, he's, he's made it, he's rehabbed himself. Let's get him around. All the people that were connected to the University of Oregon back then are still going, you know, that's Ed Reinhardt. Let's get him in. Let's, let's get him at the Oregon Club. Let's get him, in, you know, let's get him out in front of the people. So I think it's a very special place. And I, and, and I think we're really all excited that, that things went well and, and that the doctor was there and just the whole process happened. And he's here with us now. He, uh... He's, he's so strong and he's so, he, I think he totally understands and knows who he is and that his strength is not his alone, that he has strength from above. And likewise, his parents, they're so grateful for what he's been given back because it was either that or not making it at all. Uh, seeing it today in many ways is very inspiring. Uh, here you have a young man who has overcome a tremendous amount of adversity to, to do what he is doing, to go around and to inspire others. It's amazing to me. He has applied the work ethic and determination that he has as a football player simply to living today, because that's what it takes, is a lot of hard work and a lot of determination just to make it from day to day. You, know, you think about your own aches and pains and realize they're nothing in comparison to what he feels every day. Many years ago, I had an accident. I was a football star from the University of Colorado. I was second leading pass receiver in the nation. My grade point average was 3-6. In the second game of my sophomore year, I caught a pass, was tackled my Hey, the Granberry Heart. I was in a coma for 62 days. The injury was a subdural hematoma complicated by pneumonia. Doctors said it was a miracle I survived. They were sure I would stay in a vegetative state. I threw myself into rehabilitation with the same work ethic I had as a football player. I took five months before I could speak. It took two years to walk. And my intelligence is intact. And I am a great listener. Because of neurological damage, I find it difficult to put my thoughts into words. This talk I'm giving now had to be memorized word for word. 
If I have a conversation, I would understand perfectly clear. But I won't even tell you everything I want to say. My journey has been a difficult one. At times, I've been frustrated and filled with despair. But I am really one thing. If we stay over the possibility that God has for our lives, anything could happen, even a miracle. I rode a blazing saddle, I wore a shining star. My job to offer battle to bad men near and far. I conquered fear and I conquered hate. I turned dark night into day. I made my blazing saddle a choice to light the way. Pretty good. Thank you.